Hello nerds, welcome to the Geek Girl Story Salon where I talk to creatives from across disciplines and across the world about the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Jen Jackalone, lifelong storyteller and head geek in charge. We've got some great guests in the weeks, including comic artist Tyler Crook and actor Belinda Bromelow, who lose the great. So if you're not already following us, smash that like and subscribe button to stay up to date on the heaping helpings of brain food coming your way, courtesy of our partners fleetoffandoms.com and Ilva Publishing. My guest today is a fellow traveler with Silva Publishing, here today to talk about her debut novel, Honey in the Marrow, and her writing and creative process. Welcome to the show, Emily Waters. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, so I've actually been talking a lot with guests lately about um, COVID and quarantine and how it affected them creatively. Um, so I, I wonder if you could talk a little about that. Yeah. Um, so I locked down from my job. I'm a librarian for a public library system. We locked down for about 70 days. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience because my partner was still working. Um, and so I basically was alone in the house all of the time, sort of just like haunting it full time. You know, you like lose track of the day, you lose track of what time it is. Um, and I thought, oh, well, this will be a great time to write. And I think I wrote a little at the beginning and then just like couldn't write at all for maybe like three months. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I like I realized I needed to like bust out of that. So um, I like went through my work in progress folder and just found a bunch of like small things that I knew I was never going to turn it into like like larger stories but I I like made them into shorter stories to try to like kickstart myself back up again into writing and that worked um but it was a very weird time where like you felt trapped like I felt trapped creatively um we were all so scared all the time and I think if I could do it again <laughs> knowing what I know now I would do it a lot better um but yeah it it did it did shut me down for a while I think yeah well I mean for for me too and then about six months in like something snapped and and yeah you know, the gates opened up again um it was interesting uh I was talking with um with one author who was talking about how they sort of fused with uh the two Taylor Swift albums that were released oh for sure hundred percent and it seems like a fairly common experience that people, a lot of people, uh, especially creative people, had like something that they kind of, you know, that the, that they kind of hung on to really heavily during that time that sort of became like, well, this is a part of my personality now. So, And I like couldn't handle watching anything like new media wise, mm -hmm. like the idea of like a new thing where I didn't know what was going to happen made my anxiety so bad that I just watched like really cozy things over it again. I watched um, all of Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> which that is was very like, cozy. Yeah, the perfect like nothing here will hurt me show. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a lot of Star Trek. I watched like The West Wing, which I had been obsessed with when I was a teenager. And um, it took a really long time for me to like be willing to watch a new thing. And I think I had to like ease myself back into it. I'm a big Trekkie. So mm -hmm. when like new lower decks or something came out, I'm like, well, it's new, but it's like familiar. And I think right. that would be okay. And it was so. Yeah. Well, I think we, we opened the doors to disco during quarantine. So. Yeah. And I watched a lot of those, although those always made me cry and I wasn't always like, I was like, I don't know if I could do it today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's... Jessica Fletcher, she had my back, you know. Always, always. Well, you know, I mean, I I was an 80s kid, so, yeah. you know, I, I grew up yeah. on Angela Lansbury. Yeah. I, totally I watched all of the that. Mary Tyler Moore show, too, oh, wow. um, okay. which I had seen a lot of, but not for, like, a really long time, and it mm -hmm. really hit different as an adult. Like, it, but it still, it held up really well. There were a few things yeah. that didn't age. 
good. Mm. But like the jokes were, I still laughed out loud. It was really like, it was really well done. So Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it's great when you watch something that's sort of timeless and, yeah. you know, um, there's very interesting. Like I actually recently started Babylon 5. Um, oh, which, that's what I never have seen. You know, I slept on that one in the 90s. Yeah. And, you know, um, for some reason, YouTube was throwing reels up into my recommended uh gotcha. and so i said all right i think i need to like finally get on it and it was interesting because it was made in the 90s it, it's totally cheesy looking yeah and somehow it still manages to be like pretty relevant and topical um, that's how i feel about stargate it's mm -hmm. so hokey but mm -hmm. i still love it and it still has a lot of good messages so was there any one particular thing that you would say you really kind of embedded with during that time or? Probably Jessica much? Fletcher. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. I, you know, like she's so smart. She's so well read. She's a writer. She gives me like good grandma vibes. Mm -hmm. um, she was very relatable. And I, I went down like a whole Angela Lansbury rabbit hole actually I watched a lot of um after we sort of had gotten back to normal mm -hmm. I watched a lot of her like older movies that I'd never seen like the Manchurian mm -hmm. Candidate and the Harvey mm -hmm. Girls and, mm -hmm. uh, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks which I hadn't seen since I was a little kid and wow. that was really wow. fun well, that's fun um, and always Taylor Swift always. and what and always Taylor Swift ah yes <laughs> Yeah, I, I I feel very vindicated by her uh, her her current successes and how she's matured as an artist and you know. Yeah. I because... mean, I think I bought her first album when I was nineteen because I was I was a country music fan and so, mm -hmm. um, it's been a real ride of like people hate her, people love her, and I've just really consistently been a fan for like the last 20 years <laughs> well that's the, well that's interesting because you really yeah. got to sort of mature with her and yeah so that's that's like yeah like she's kind of yeah about... it's a lot of like milestones of like mm. um i started dating my partner like right when the red album came out mm. and then we had just gotten married right when 1989 came out and so like you can really like track her milestones mm -hmm. along with and it's which is very parasocial I get it like she's not my friend but no. um it's you know her era is really sort of our all of the millennial girls eras mm -hmm. yeah well it's a funny thing because when you have you know an artist like that or honestly even you know a book series where the characters age over time like you know, I mean, whatever she's, you know, her, her name is sort of verboten, but like, you know, with the Harry Potter books, mm -hmm. you know, people who started out with their parents reading the books to them when they were kids matured along with the characters. And, you know, by the time they were teenagers, they had grown up alongside these characters. And I think there's something very interesting about that. That is interesting. And I did that too. I remember, you know, you had to wait for the next book to come out. So you really did have to like grow up with them. And now I have parents coming into the library and they have their like nine, 10, 11 year old kid who wants to read the first one and then wants to read all of them like bam, 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 bam. And I think there's some value in being the age of mm. those characters when they're doing those more like violent, terrifying, mm. warlike things. <laughs> But now if you're 10 and you're a fast reader, you, you sort of slam yeah. it all down in one year, which is an interesting. Yeah, yeah it's it's odd. I, I wonder I wonder if there's I mean, I'm, I don't know. There's been studies about everything, but I wonder if there's been any studies about how that developmentally tracks. Yeah, maybe. Um, so uh, so let's talk about your book uh, yeah. that came out, I guess, at about this time last year, right? Yeah, it came out in October of last year mm -hmm. um, and it's called Honey in the Marrow and it has done very well. I had really no expectations because I had nothing to compare it to. It's my first book mm -hmm. um, and I've just been sort of pleasantly surprised the whole way. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just been a fun ride. Did you write that during quarantine or is the is it older than that? It's it's older. I'm a fan fiction writer. That's where I came from. And I think Ilva has done a really good job of sort of tapping 
that market. It's like a really endless well of talent that people sort of ignore because of the like stigma of, I don't know, yeah. women liking things, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's what people hate. Yeah, um, no, I, I, I get I get you. I, yeah, I could, so you know. uh, it was a fan fiction I'd written, I don't know, maybe like three or four years before I published it. Mm-hmm. And, and um, they sort of swooped into my DMs and was like, hey girl, do you want to... Uh, <laughs> do you want how would you feel about yeah publishing wow. the story with them. okay um which because I had sort of thought you know maybe as like a bucket list thing um <laughs> publishing one day but I wasn't really disciplined enough or willing at the time to like put the effort into like finding an agent doing the submission process I had like, you know like a marriage and a full-time career and like that takes a lot of time and I just sure. wasn't in that headspace yet. But I thought, well, if it happens, it happens. And so I think it, you know, that when happened. they come and say, Hey, we'll just do this. I was like, great, let's do it. So that was really fun. So I, I'm, I did read it by the way. Um, and oh, cool. you know, it's uh, it's, it's definitely everything that a romance reader would want out of a romance. Um, <laughs> so, and, and you don't have to say if you don't want to, but um can you can you say what it was originally or what its genesis was? Yeah, so uh, it was a the closer fan fiction, um, which was a show huh. like okay. I yeah. think it was like two thousand five mm-hmm. to two thousand twelve yeah. with Kira Sedgwick. Yeah, I know it, and there there was quite a uh, there was quite a community around that show. Yeah, I I came to it late actually. I had always watched the show live um and i don't know why it had never occurred to me to write for it um i think i was just busy in like other fandoms and so um i came i think i started writing maybe after it was over i think major crimes was still in the air i think the closer was already over Mm -hmm. um and i i had my first one i started writing i think it was a sharon andy story and I don't know why I was writing that, but like, it just wasn't clicking. And then Mm -hmm. um, I think in the middle, sort of like Brenda showed back up and was like, Hey, I'm also here. And I was like, Oh, okay. This makes (laughs) sense. Um, So yeah, I, I wrote that um, sort of the concept of this story, which is funny because you said it's like what every romance reader would want, but like largely it's a story about grief um, which is not like inherently a romantic sort of aspect, but um, the concept was here's a really competent woman professionally who sort of um, her whole identity is tied up in her job mm-hmm. um, and this marriage that she has. And then what would it take to like take all of that away and have her start over? And I think grief was the obvious choice of if you like strip away the job and you strip away the marriage like what's left what does that look like how do you get out of it and like what does it take to get someone like that back on their feet Mm -hmm. so that was sort of the main idea of that story and then while I was writing it it was like a exercise more and then while I was writing it my grandfather passed away um and so like the grief became really real and I think that's why people say a lot like, oh, her depression, her sadness is like so realistic. And it was like my sadness mm-hmm. that I was writing into that book. Um, and I think it saved me a little because it gave me a way to like process all of that sadness uh-huh. and grief. And as she sort of made her way through it, I was making my way through it. Mm-hmm. Um, we came out the other side, you know, and I have a book to show for it now. Yeah. So that's really cool. So so then so then there's there's quite a bit of you in Stella, I guess. Is that fair to uh, say? Yeah. I would say I'm also <laughs> a competent professional who's not the best at personal relationships. Um I'm an introvert, like I feel like I don't make friends that easily. I have a lot of friends, but I feel like they make me, you know. Um and so I always related to that archetype of character of like why is she so good at this one thing and like so trash garbage at this other thing 
Um, <laughs> and people are just like that, I guess. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I find Stella relatable. I'm not necessarily likable. I'm not always the most likable person either. Mm. Um, she's prickly, especially when she's this sad. She's very damaged. Mm. And she lashes out a lot. And people have to be really patient with her. Um, and I understand that. Um, and so I always say Stella is the one I'm more like. And Elizabeth is the like type that I'm more attracted to. Mm. Um, versus me being more like Elizabeth. Because I'm mm. not really. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I mean, I think it's sort of, I think it's sort of hard to avoid our, our personalities creeping into our characters. Oh, sure. Um, you know, like I sort of had this realization that, you know, across the, you know, umpteen manuscripts that I have sitting around, there's a certain type of heroine that I keep writing. Yeah. You know, and mainly it's, you know, she's usually very good at her job very cerebral, not like ice queen, but just very, very cerebral and bad at feelings. Yeah. Who's good at feelings? I, you know, you know, there, there are people, there are people, but you know, I, I think a lot, a lot of us are not. Yeah. And my partner, like every six months is like, do you, do you want to discuss some feelings? <laughs> and I'm like, no, thanks. You know, <laughs> And every once in a while, they're like, no, it's time. We got to like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we yeah. got to make sure you're doing okay. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but. So what is it, what is it about the, the ice queen trope? Do you think for I you think personally and just for audiences in general? Yeah. I think there's something about someone who's beautiful, but distant up mm -hmm. on a pedestal mm -hmm. And then like finding that one thing that like melts them down off of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a Ice Queen alone, just being root, the Miranda Priestley or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't necessarily want to hang out with that person, but when you are the thing that makes them melt, like right. you can't beat it. Right. So, and I don't necessarily consider Elizabeth to be a traditional Ice Queen. I think Stella is an unreliable narrator and she feels that Elizabeth and their like previous work being together was like cold and distant and mean and didn't like her. But like that was never really the case. Like she's reserved mm -hmm. and I think she compartmentalized her work life away from her personal life. Um, but as you make your way through the book, like Elizabeth's very patient and she's gentle and she's kind and she just wants the best for Stella. And yeah. um, and it's like really Stella's coloring of the situation that makes her seem right. like a nice queen. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was interesting because even in, in you know, the very beginning when she first shows up, um, it's pretty clear that she has genuine concern. Yeah. Which, you know, from from Stella's narrative about how she perceives her as this, you know, unpleasant person or whatever, that it didn't quite add up. No. And it takes a long time to, I think, realize that about herself, which is um, the reason why she feels that way about Elizabeth. I don't think she realizes right away that it's like an attraction issue because um, she's been married to this man. And I think you really, you know, those high achieving people, they start down this path and, you know, they go to law school and then they realize they don't really want to be a lawyer, but it's too late because they've done it all. So they have to stick it out. Or you marry someone and you realize maybe this isn't really what I want, but it's too late. We're married and it's too much work to get unmarried. So we're just going <laughs> to stick it out. And, um, you know, I think, Elizabeth was a very big wrench in that situation for her. And so she really pushed her away a lot of the time. And, but then once you take away that job and you take away that marriage and you've like burned it all to the ground and all there's left to do is rebuild it. Mm -hmm. Like why not rebuild it in a thing that you actually want? Right. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I thought it was very effective um, how you handled that. Um. 
So my question, I guess my next question is, um, do you primarily think of yourself as a romance author or do you envision stretching out or genre bending? I mean, you mentioned you're, you're into Trek and stuff like that. Do you ever yeah. see yourself kind I, of going in, in some of those other directions? Like, I think I always thought of myself as sort of like a domestic fiction writer, which is like a terrible, like, phrase because you know like chiclet or whatever mm -hmm. um but i feel like my stories that i write over and over and over again as you were saying um are confident people but like their home life is what interests me mm -hmm. um i like you know stories where they putter around and go shopping and mm -hmm. think about their thoughts and stuff like that so i usually there was an aspect of romance but until I started working with Ilva, I never really thought of myself as like a romance writer. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I have written a lot of Star Trek or sci-fi and stuff like that. Um, I do have another book coming out that's more, it's still a romance, but it has like a little bit of a thriller aspect to it. Like a more of a, you know, like the main story is like more of a mystery thriller and then the romance is like the B plot. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I tend to I tend to operate in a similar way. That the there's the main plot is usually something else, and the yeah. romance is sort of wound up in it or and around it. Um, yeah, I never write like like I read that book. Mistakes were made, mm -hmm. um, which was great but like it never occurs to me to write to people like hooking up at the beginning mm -hmm. and then like figuring it out like I I like a slow burn I like the character development I like you know the like we want to but we shouldn't aspect um mm -hmm. of the getting together and so it's not just the like spicy romance part that interests me but that is usually more a result of sorry there's an airplane going away <laughs> that's usually more a result of like the character growth and those characters becoming so close that like intimacy is just the next step mm -hmm. um versus like the intimacy for the sake of it mm -hmm. yeah I don't know. That part of things is uh, it can vary for me. Like yeah. sometimes it's fun to just sort of have it be like a lightning strike, instant chemistry, you know. And then other times it's it's nice to let it kind of slow burn. Um, yeah, I like I like to read a lightning strike. Mm. Um, it just never occurs to me to write it. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm 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 all over the place with it. Uh, you know, I contain multitudes in that way. Yeah. Um, so are are you are you working on a, a next book? Yeah. So my next book with Ilva comes out in January. Okay. And then I have another one that's like further back mm -hmm. in production, and I I promised them three, and then. Um, we can sort of reevaluate, but it's been a really good partnership. So I don't foresee um, wanting to leave it. Uh, I It's interesting to watch like the other people in our publishing house. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, you know, like since Honey and the Marrow has come out, have like published like two more books or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I find that fascinating because I just, A, I don't write that fast. Mm -hmm. And B, like, I have a whole full-time job. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> finding the time to write is always, like, a dance. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you sort of fall into that comparison trap of, like, oh, well, maybe I'd be better off if I, like, had a book come out every nine months or whatever. But it's just not realistic for me. Um, and maybe someday it'll be a situation where I decide to write full time. Um, but I think, you know, like I'd rather work on a book and be really happy with it than feel like I need to churn something out. Mm -hmm. not, not to say that those people aren't doing that. I think they just have a lifestyle where they have a little bit more time than I do. 
Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we all work at different paces, you know, uh, I mean, I have a writer friend who just agonizes over every sentence and it takes her forever to produce something. But when it's eventually there, it's awfully good. So it's like, well, can I really argue with the, with the results? I don't, you know, I don't think that, I don't think that I can. No, I have a coworker who I love dearly. Um, and he's been world building this huge book series that he's wanted to write since he was 12 and he's in his forties now. And he's constantly carrying around stack of index cards and talking about the characters and talking about writing the book. And finally I'm like, you just, you got to write it, man. And he's like, well, you know, it's a big world and there's a lot of detail. And I'm like, whatever, if you don't ever sit down and write it, Mm-hmm. You're just going to be carrying around this stack of index cards for your whole life. So, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and again, it's like I, I have so many things that are in different stages. Like, I have yeah. a project like that where it's just like, you know, it's outlined, but it's like this very huge world and it's like sprawling and there's all these characters. It's like, a, you know, George R. R. Martin worthy sprawling thing. And it's just not the time. Are you a big outliner? Do you like plot way ahead? Not when I'm writing by myself. When I'm co-writing, I do. Sure. That makes sense. Oh. I'm I'm not at all, really. Um, I just sort of am like, well, let's see what happens next. Who knows? Not me, not you. Um, and then when things start getting long, I do, I think, have a notebook that I have to be like, okay, here's this character's name. This is the mm-hmm. time of year. You know, mm-hmm. like I sort of backwards outline, but um, I just, I feel like if I spend a lot of time making an outline, I wouldn't follow it anyways. So. Right. Cause you get in the, you get in the weeds and then everything yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, one thing, I don't know. And I guess this falls into the, the, you know, the planner versus pantser debate, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm somewhere in the middle, I think, because like, I'll write up to a certain point and then realize I need to figure out what's, you know, the next bit. Yeah. So like, I'll plot out to a certain point and then go, mm-hmm. well, once I get through the weeds, I'll have a better idea of where I need to go after that. And I feel like I generally have like one scene that really interests me. Mm-hmm. And then I spend the whole book writing towards that. And sometimes you write the scene and then you have to like backfill, but like that usually is the sort of anchor point that I'm swimming towards. Right. Right. It's like you have this one thing and you know, yes, it would be embarrassing to admit that you wrote this whole book around it, but. (laughs) I'm not embarrassed. I did it. You did it. Like (laughs) I think that one thing for Honey and the Marrow was that like hug in the bedroom. That was the thing that Mm. I was thinking about the most and I was like Mm. how do I get there and then what happens Mm. next Mm. interesting yeah it's it's uh it's fun you never you never know like where you're gonna end up until you actually get in there that's for me yeah no I you know I know other I know other writers who really you know do these like 30 page outlines and I'm like how and sometimes I write a paragraph and I'm like why would I do that (laughs) Now I mean, like, <laughs> where did that come from? Who allowed this? Not me. It just yeah. happened. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so who's, is there, uh, I imagine you have some influences, but who's, who, what authors are, are really big influences for you? Yeah, that's a real loaded question for a librarian. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I was a, like a real child of books. So I think, my favorite book of all time is Harriet the Spy okay. um, by Lise Fitzhugh. And she wrote in a sort of like very honest way that I sort of admire and carry with me always. Um, I think of that sentence a lot that her nurse, her nanny says to her is like, sometimes you have to lie and you do it to make other people feel good, you know? And I think about that a lot. Um, I loved Madeline Langle, the Wrinkle in Time series. Um, I think my favorite author as a teenager was Alice Hoffman. And she's still writing a lot. And she wrote this um, very domestic, magical realism style where, you know, like, 
these little sprinkles of magic were just like part of everyday life and really were kind of a annoying burden a lot of the time. Um, and then I was never, I have to admit something terrible. I was never really a Devil Wears Prada fan. So <laughs> I know it's like a terrible thing to say. So no. I had never read Truth and Measure, mm -hmm. um, the massive juggernaut that it is. But when the books came out, I did read them and I enjoyed them immensely. So Rosalind Sinclair, right. I think the first book I bought was The X Factor. Hmm. Is the X Ingredient? What is it? The X Ingredient. Something like that. Something I, I'm, like that. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't part of that, that community yeah. at all. So. And it, it's been a, interesting because I'll like pick up some popular like sapphic fiction and I'll be like, is this just Devil Wears Prada again? You know, like they get me every time I like pull them yep. out. Yep. It's Devil Wears Prada. And, and, and sometimes it is. Yeah. And, you know, it's so, and it's so interesting to me. Like, why do we keep telling the same story over yeah. and over? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a comfort in a way. Hmm. And I think that's the joy of fan fiction a lot is you take, a world and some characters that you're really already comfortable and familiar with and you you can skip the like introductions and the world building and all of that and you just get to the good parts right away and mm -hmm. I, I think that's why people like it so much yeah yeah it's just like you know you have an attachment with these characters and you know yes i can watch these same two idiots fall in love over and over over and over again yeah in in multiple different ways yeah um what other is there or is there any other media that you're consuming lately that you're enjoying books um, tv shows music whatever yeah i'm loving lower decks i know not everybody is into it but i think it's a great love letter to long time mm -hmm. trek fans mm -hmm. um, and i'll watch it with my partner and they enjoy it too occasionally i pause and i'm like this is what that means and they're like great um so we've been doing that we've been watching what we do in the shadows which is really oh, yeah. fun yeah. and weird and hilarious mm -hmm. and uh i think that's about it. it's been weird because of the strike we sort of have stopped watching a lot mm -hmm. of that we watch mm -hmm. a lot of house hunters <laughs> um <laughs> Okay. It's we love to watch it, and then um, we enjoy hating the same things. You know, mm. if that makes sense. So um, we watch a lot of that, and then yeah, uh, I just read this book called *The Bandit Queens* by Perini Shroff, and it's um, a really interesting story about this woman who in this Indian village who has this reputation of killing off her husband. And she didn't really do it, but she like doesn't dissuade the reputation. Mm -hmm. And then um, suddenly women come around and they're like, hey, can you help me kill my husband too? And she's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so she either has to do it or come clean. Um, so that was a really good read. Mm. Uh, that sounds interesting, actually. Yeah. So I uh, I was wondering if you happened to bring anything for show and tell. I did, in fact. Okay. okay. I brought... Um, this which uh was a gift from one of my readers her name is katie manning right. and she uh works in publishing or at least worked in publishing for a little while and this is uh my fan fiction it's called giving up on greener grasses and she loved it so much that she had it bound. bound oh that's so nice and she sent me a couple copies um and it was before i published honey in the marrow so like i'd never seen anything i'd written bound before right right and she used, like someone else's brenda sharon fan art that they had made around the okay. story at the okay. cover oh look at that which is so cool oh that's cool and so um yeah this was really this was such a amazing sweet gift and uh i think about it all the time hmm. that's a great that's a great uh that's a great share thank you yeah, I was like, what do I have? Um, so I think that's really meaningful, you know, and I think gifts from fans it was not something I sort of considered. Mm -hmm. um, and really, like I, one of the most mind blowing things about this whole process is people who read my fan fiction who read the book, which was 
I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then I had people who read the book who then went and found my fan fiction and read it. And I don't know why it didn't occur to me that that was like a two way street. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's been really interesting and cool. Um, And people are excited for a new book and I'm excited to get them. So comes out in January. Cool. Cool. Well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, well, I'm probably not going to be starting this season again for a little while. You're, you're <laughs> actually, you're actually one of the last guests of this season. Ooh. So, um, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, well, you know, maybe we can uh, have you back to, to talk about the next book. You have a book coming out with Ella now too, don't you? I do. Um, Tell me it a is, little bit about it. It is coming out in um, actually in a few weeks. Um, mm-hmm. It's already up for pre-order. Ooh. Uh, um, and it yeah. is it is a a romantic suspense. Um, Love it. We have a a. It's all set in Europe. It's mm-hmm. uh, a detective for Europol, specifically an art detective, and she's. At a place in her life where her career is stagnating because this thief got away a few years ago, mm-hmm. that she used to she used to be partners with her partner, sure. And you know they had this great marriage and they had everything. And this then this thief got away, and my my heroine d- developed a gambling problem, and her marriage unraveled. And she got reckless in the field and got benched. And so she's in this really bad place. And then this thief comes out of retirement. Mm -hmm. So she is returned to the field, but she has to work the case with her ex, who she hasn't seen in six years. And, you know, it was quite a bitter Mm -hmm. divorce. So, and of course, the ex is Italian and passionate and you know 100 percent in it for the drama yeah you know um that's great and i love as you know books where the characters are older you know mm-hmm. established yeah interesting have a life to live. i think that's what i loved about jessica fletcher too she wasn't like an ingenue right um yeah i think that age bracket is so interesting yeah, I mean, you know, I, you can tell stories. You can tell nice stories with younger characters, for sure. For sure. And people do, and there's mm-hmm. plenty of that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, mature women are, are my my jam. Um, most of the time, I don't really write much younger than, you know, characters in their 30s, at least not for yeah. anything I publish. Um, yeah i read one last stop which was very sweet and cute but the which, whole time which which sorry, is the which? casey uh casey mcquiston's one last stop okay it was very fun but the whole time i was like oh i'm too old for this <laughs> like i don't relate to these characters i think they right. should just go to class right um, right yeah like she's blown off work for like three weeks in a row like this <laughs> you know i just i was yeah. like i'm I'm the mom. I'm like, go to school. Right. Right. It's like your babies learn how to talk to each other, communicate. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's one thing that drives me wild about books too, like mm. um, mystery and suspense when they're just like, go, 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 go. And mm. it's been several days and they haven't slept and they never go to the bathroom and they never eat anything. And I'm like, what is, what is fueling this? I don't mm-hmm. understand. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah. Well, I, I, I get, I do get into that a little bit. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm just assuming it's happening off the page. Yeah. Like an app. But, you know, they, they go to Paris to, to chase a, a lead and, you know, they, they do the, you know, interrogate the person they were going to, to speak to and realize they haven't eaten all day so they go and sit down at a beach but they think about it and right. they get a bite that's right. the important part thank right. you um yeah uh, you know i'm like look i'm you know they're running around europe they're in paris you know they're yeah, in Christmas. amsterdam they're in monaco like <laughs> we need to enjoy the scenery and there needs to be a few pages of food porn i mean come on please for the hungry girls and you know, I mean, and I had I had a, a particularly a fun time with that because, um, you know, my heroine is not really a cook. The yeah. ex, the ex was the cook, mm. and there's a bit in the beginning where you know, 
just this offhanded line about how she never, like food doesn't taste like anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's been that way since they separated. And, you know, they're back in Amsterdam and they end up back at her apartment. And the ex just goes into the freezer and starts whipping something up. And, you know, it's the she tastes it and it's the first time she's tasted food. You and got me. Like, I got you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that that was and that was the thing. Like the the trick with that story was making it kind of making the romantic part and the 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 chasing the art thief part kind of go hand in hand and feed each yeah. other. But yeah, I had I had a blast with it. Yeah, my new one takes place in the nineties. Um, <laughs> which do we consider that historical fiction now? I don't know. Mm -hmm. At Ooh. this point, at this point, I we kind of I think we might. Um, yeah, that that hurts me, but yeah, no, I understand I it. it. Um, I get it. But it was really fun to research the technology and what. Mm -hmm you know what was happening politically and historically and the clothes and the mm -hmm. music and so um, yeah i really had a good time with that yeah i mean yeah. i remember it some <laughs> um but i yeah. wasn't you know as a child i wasn't right. like what's happening with rodney king you know yeah no my my memories of the 90s are quite clear <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah i'm 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 in a i'm in like a local writers group and i actually this woman submitted a, a romance novel that um that was set in the 90s and it was sort of fun to like read it and be like oh and this new thing called email you know <laughs> yeah and i think i work with a lot of like younger kids the students who are shelvers in the library Mm -hmm. And I don't think they realize I'm as old as I am. And mm -hmm. the one thing that really like clicks it in for them is mm -hmm. I tell them um, when I started high school, it was the nineties mm -hmm. and they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, they're like <laughs> sad and disgusted. Um, <laughs> I'm like, it's okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are coming up on time. Yep, um, we're good. The Thank other so thing much. that we do um is usually there's a little speed round at the end and okay. this one is going to be tropes okay so i'm going to throw two tropes at you and you're going to tell me which one you like better good easy okay friends to lovers or enemies to lovers enemies to lovers fake dating or secret identity secret identity hard to love hero or sympathetic villain Ooh, sympathetic villain last one forbidden romance or only one bed. Oh, Sophie's choice. <laughs> I will say forbidden romance, but I do love bed sharing a lot. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, the, that one's that, a toss up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A, 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 lot, a lot of people have trouble with that one. If they that one to. could be the same you know two different sides of the same coin right if you because if, if it's forbidden anyway right right so it's like yeah if you if you sort of smush it together the right way you can it's you can the perfect it's the perfect trope work yeah. work both in there but uh yeah forced proximity everybody loves Oof. that one everybody does yeah but i love the like we want to but we can't oh that's good it's yeah different. and like yeah and it's especially once once you've admitted that you want to and can't Mm -hmm. then it's you know it kind then of ratchets. It's the clock is ticking oh yeah ratchets yeah. it up <laughs> well that was fun thank you well thank you um so uh stick around for a minute um <laughs> i'm gonna wrap up uh that's our show you beautiful nerds i've been your host jen jackalone please hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed this chat and check out the links in the description to keep up with all of emily's upcoming work and we've got more brain food coming your way so for best results stay hydrated take care take it easy and stay geeky